Nice. And welcome to uh, the future of Linux panel here at KubeCon. Um, my name is Vincent Batts. I'm CTO at Kinfolk and have been in the container space for a long time, so lots of familiar faces. And I will we'll kick off the introductions with our panelists today with a brief question to get the conversation started. Um, so mull on it, if you will. Does it still make sense to run a general purpose operating system, Linux operating system in this cloud native world? Um, let's kick off our round of introductions. Christian, why don't you go first? Sure. Um, so I'm in the middle of a transition. I was at Canonical for 15 years and I'm about um, to, to join a new company in Brazil that's through an acquisition of a side business that I had. This company is a big retailer called Magazine Luiza or Magalu. They have a huge technology team and they're big users of Kubernetes, um, have basically every single technology stack across the company. So it'll be interesting to see from the oh, wow. inside what the user perspective is. Yeah. So, so, so being at Canonical for 15 years, uh, you probably have some opinions on general purpose Linux. Yes, I think so. Yes, yeah. I, I had opinions before that already, but I think was, <laughs> my time at Canonical sort of cemented that as well. Um, <laughs> Is the OS relevant? I think this is a big technology transition and those are always interesting and produce kind of, kind of unexpected results. The, the big questions I think are gonna be, what, how will the distro vendors react to the change that cloud native brings? If platforms and distros basically have built this um, value of being a bridge between upstreams that release at their own cadence that develop on their own um, timelines and priorities to what users expect in terms of maintainability of long-term long -term support or predictability of release. Like how does that value translate into a world where developers are picking all the components that go into the, into the container itself? What, what about the interface between kernel and the user space since um, you don't have a kernel inside the container. You have to use the host container. And so those are the interesting questions a little bit that are there. I will, will and I won't spoil for the rest of the panel. I have some opinions yeah, about yeah, where yeah. it's going to go, good, but good, good. I think those are the big existential questions for people that are building general purpose Linuxes in general. Nice, nice, nice. All right, um, next up, Dusty. Why don't you hey. introduce yourself as, and give us a little opinion? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Dusty Mabe. I'm an engineer at Red Hat. That's kind of how I know Vincent. We used to work together a little bit. Uh, I started out my career um, even before Red Hat in the telecommunications space, but then came to Red Hat and since have focused on uh, kind of the container OS space, uh, first with Project Atomic, uh, Atomic Host, and most recently uh, with the acquisition of CoreOS uh, Inc., uh, the merging of container Linux and Atomic Host into uh, our upstream Fedora CoreOS, uh, which is where I spend most of my time, and then also Red Hat CoreOS, which is part of OpenShift. Um, so that's kind of where I've been. As far as, you know, a general purpose OS in a cloud native world, um, obviously we're getting more to the point where, uh, you know, special purpose OSs or container focused OSs seem to, uh, you know, solve some needs that platforms have on top. But at the same time, I don't think necessarily general purpose OSs are going anywhere soon. I mean, uh, we really leverage in this special container OSs, uh, we, we leverage the ecosystem that the general purpose OSs provide. In our case, we have Fedora, we have RHEL, uh, but there's rarely a new container OS that you see that starts completely from scratch. <laughs> so uh, there's always a role to be played there. Yeah, that's fair. All right, thank you. And Tasha, why don't you go next? Hey, uh, I'm Tasha Drew. I'm Director of Product Incubation at VMware in the Office of the CTO. I was responsible for launching the uh, VMware Tanzu Kubernetes Grid Service for vSphere, and I was part of the team that launched Project Pacific, or vSphere with Tanzu. Um, I'm also co-chair of the Multi-Tenancy Working Group for Kubernetes and co-chair of SIG Usability. Um, nice and nice. yeah, as far as uh, the question about operating systems, I think that there's sort of like an interesting historical separation of um, 
operations teams and application development teams that resulted in this drive towards having like this golden image that may not have anything to do with the applications being deployed on it. Um, so a lot of things have gotten baked into the operating system layer that the applications deployed on it don't actually need. And being able to have more um, purpose built operating systems that serve the needs of the applications running on it makes a lot of sense in terms of just uh, minimizing your footprint, having fewer attack vectors and not uh, shipping a lot of stuff in that lower level that you don't actually need. Um, and so I think a lot of it kind of comes down to the build, the build tool systems that we have. Uh, I still think there's a ton of value in the people who are doing all of the backbreaking work of maintaining uh, the base operating system components that everybody leverages uh, and the community that works on maintaining those as well and uh, proliferating them. So uh, yeah, I kind of have a, a little bit of a mixed bag opinion. Yeah, that's a split view on, but it is interesting that that um, that even you know saying ops versus ops versus apps teams does kind of give two completely different like focal points of the same set of software. Darren, um, that probably leads pretty well into how, how you have operation teams versus enabling apps teams. Why don't you go next? Yeah. Um... Yeah, hi, so I'm Darren Shepard, uh, CTO and co-founder at Rancher Labs. Um, Rancher, we do multi-cluster management Kubernetes, and we've also done some container-optimized OSs. Um, yeah, so that's my background. So uh, regarding this question, gonna like I could I could probably like a uh, you know monologue for the next half an hour about the answer to this question. <laughs> Don't like, do it. Yes. <laughs> so I'm I'm gonna keep it short, but does it make sense? Uh, to run a general purpose OS in the cloud native world? I would say no. <laughs> um, but it's actually, it's significantly more nuanced than that because, you know, it's like, what do you call a general purpose OS? And, and you know, it's like, well, if, I, if I'm saying the answer is no, does that mean the, the death of a Ubuntu or Red Hat or something? No, that's not true. Because it's really all of the definitions of these things are changing. Like the assets that come from a Linux, the e ecosystem or vendor are all completely still uh, relevant, but they're just packaged and delivered in a completely different way. Because like, I don't even really like the term of container optimized Linux, because the reality of when you look at these things is they almost have nothing to do with containers, except for the fact that they have Docker or Podman or Kubernetes on it. It's like a container optimized Linux is still a general purpose OS because it can run basically any, any, any uh, workload. It's just how the workload is packaged and delivered. So I think there's a huge transition that we're going to see as we go into the cloud native world of like how users interact with the Linux distribution, what they're expecting from it. And I also see a lot of interesting opportunities for Kubernetes and Kubernetes distributions to effectively replace what is Linux distributions today. Um, and uh, sorry, that's a little off topic. I'll just say something real short and then I'll stop. It's just that the, the, Linux distribution today is really a kernel and a set of user space, right? And so there are a bunch of user space packages that run on the kernel, right? So when you look at Kubernetes, our view of a Kubernetes distribution is very naive right now. I think it's very myopic. Um, it's because we have Kubernetes, but then we have a whole host of applications and software that run on top of it. And like you see that from the CNCF landscape, you know, this gigantic uh, slide of all this crap. Good software, sorry, not crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and so, you know, how, you know, there's, there's still the fundamental need that Linux distributions always provided, which is like delivering packages that run on the kernel. Now we kind of need the same thing in the cloud native space. So it's like, but those, those packages that, you know, run on top of Kubernetes, they still have Linux bits inside of them. They still have glibc and they still have, you know, uh, Java runtime and all the, you know, so this is just all changing. That, that's basically. Mm -hmm. yep. no, I, I do think um, lots of lessons learned of, software packaging in general that have been invented and reinvented in so, so many ways. And we're just going to reinvent them again in the container space. So um, good, good, good. So then with that, I mean, like you, 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 you're talking about, you know, everybody's kind of mentioned like the, the way that these things are changing and uh, even to some extent kind of implying that obviously there's um, enough players in the scene that are interested in seeing it play, you know, play out. And I think one of these things that's interesting is that it's like, yeah, I don't think that any of the general purposes are going, OSs are going away and I don't think they need to. Um, 
but in some ways the pie is just getting bigger. So like what, what purpose they did is fine, but the cloud native space is expanding out. Um, and so with that, you've seen, you know, um, different cloud providers come up with either their own, you know, optimized OS, uh, Linux OS, and then, you know, all of them are trying to compete for different kinds of managed Kubernetes offerings. Um, do you think that that's going to have uh, an impact on the, the kind of broader market? So like if we say, okay, there's general purposes and then there's all these derivatives, but now there's like a competition for optimized derivatives and people won't have maybe what they were familiar with, but it kind of narrows down, you know, for whatever particular use case, like cloud vendor optimized what kind of impact do you think that'll have on the market? Who wants to go first on that one? Let me let me take a bridge from what Darren said. I think Darren's point, the main point, is that while the the companies themselves and like the core assets that they have may not change, like what what gets delivered to end customers, I think has to change. Like there's no question. And the thing is that the the piece of the operating system that runs underneath the container in Kubernetes that is going to that is although the kernel is really relevant, it's so small, like the number of components there is so little that there is like actual value in the cloud provider or whoever's pre preparing the whole stack, giving, optimizing that entire layer. So I think that's something which is absolutely a, a likely trend to come that they'll optimize this deliverable, which is, as Darren is saying, like how much is that actually Linux? You know, okay, it's Linux from the kernel perspective. What else is there? Like there's not a lot there, you know, that, that just serves, um, enough scaffolding for you to boot the, 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 the containers off. There's one um, wild card on that though, which is that as you move into enterprise, everyone says, oh, hold on, but I need to run my asset tracking or I need to run like what, my, my IDS pieces on this layer as well. So I think that's the only piece where I'm not sure what the future actually will look for that. But that, that something specific to yeah. be delivered for that, that's small, atomically um, updatable, um, safe to basically um, roll back and forward. I think that's definitely coming. The, the question is this thing, like, what do you do? Like when somebody says, oh, I need to put, put, my, put the BMC agent on this. And people are like, well, you can't install any software on this layer. Like there's yeah, no yeah, way yeah. to put any packages in. What do I do? Or probably even more scary than that. You know, like somebody's looking at a checklist and they say, well, it says here, I have to deploy to X. Is this X? And you say, yeah. well, no, it's, it's, it's a better derivative, you know? <laughs> yes, I, I don't even know what, like, how do I, like, it's, that, that question doesn't compute in the context of where it's landing. Yeah, like, IS, ISV, ISV certification is a, is a big deal, too. You know, it's like yeah. a lot of people are like, I'd have to run this OS because that's what, you know, this vendor has certified on, um, which completely changes when, you know, as vendors are starting to package, you know, their third-party software on top of Kubernetes. What does it now mean to certify, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in, in, in that's kind of interesting space. I mean, or, a, question, a question for you there and on that, like, can you run a workload which is certified for SUSE on a non SUSE kernel underneath the container? Yeah, and even 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 Dusty could wade into that one a little bit. Yeah, and, and, well, and what does it mean, you know, uh, is there even, honestly, is there even such thing as can I certify for Kubernetes in general, you know, or am I actually certifying for EKS or, or you know, um, like VMware Suite or, or, or whatever, OpenShift. Um, you know, those are interesting questions. So, but going back to because I, I already forgot, Vince. Like Vince, what, what, what was the, what was the original question? You asked? <laughs> no, this is good. Uh, it was it was more like is is it a useful trend that we see these kind of optimized derivatives? Because there's a few you know players in the scene, and you know, like you've even had experience with having kind of an optimized yeah, that's right. um, focus. But is it a useful, useful trend, or is it well, like I mean, have a so dangerous I, impact on the market? No, I said so. Well, I mean, it's disruptive for sure. Like, so there's there's like the bottle rocket and like Google's container optimized. Um, you know, Microsoft, I they haven't announced. I, I don't think a, a, a Linux, a, you know, container distro or whatever. But I, I imagine one would come at some point. Um, honestly, I think it makes total sense for these uh, um, cloud providers because it's like what's the touch point of the customer? It's like the customer or the end user, uh, they really want Kubernetes. So wh why do they need to care about the nodes and what's running on the nodes? The interface is Kubernetes. And this is why like, it's, it's tricky, especially if you're a Linux vendor of like, well, what does this mean now? Because effectively that Linux layer is the, the kernel itself or the container Linux, whatever is 
it's fairly commoditized for most, you know, it's like people mm-hmm. don't really want to pay for it that much. Um, and, and they, since they don't interact directly with it, it's very hard to differentiate because, you know, it's like Ubuntu, for example, like they're, you know, rise to fame or whatever is all about kind of users interacting with it and enjoying it right and if i'm not touching the node os anymore like so it's like the the only way to differentiate even if there's i don't i would say maybe there's not even a need to differentiate anymore because you know if you just say it's a commodity but the only way to uh differentiate is through uh capabilities and that's where i still see os's uh being somewhat important right now is uh, especially, let's say, like in the edge space where I've been working a lot recently, where it's like GPUs and devices and and all these things still matter because they very much touch the OS. Um, so it's like, well, your OS is not capable, you know, because it doesn't have these whatever proprietary yeah. drivers. And that kind of leads towards like, you know, if you need a BMC or, you know, it's like it's the capabilities, not so much the the the. Uh, actually interacting and using it, I guess. Yeah, Tasha, do, Tasha, do you, or Dusty, do you want to wait into that one? Yeah, I mean, I, as far as, you know, different cloud providers coming up with their own distros, is that a useful trend? I, I think you can go both ways, right? Um, it's useful because anytime you bring new ideas to the market, um, there's things that can be learned, but at the same time, it also increases fragmentation a little bit. Like there's now more options. And if you happen to be rolling, you know, trying to set up Kubernetes yourself, um, you know, here's a new option to consider, which is options are good, but they also uh, might uh, confuse people or lead them down the wrong path at some point. I'm not sure. Um, But I think Darren had a good point, which is it depends on who you are, right? Are you just clicking a button and having the entire cluster set up for you and it's completely managed, not, you know, you're not managing the cluster? If that's the case, um, then, uh, you know, the role of the distro does have a lot less of a, of a role, at least as, that you're concerned with, right? The, the OS is still very important. And we see that every time there's a new security issue that comes out, right? Um, but who cares, who's responsible for it, right, uh, is, is the big part. And we've seen the, um, the, the lines move more and more towards, you know, more is being taken care of by something that you outsource, you pay for it. It's a cloud platform and you care just about your app, right? And that service that you're providing to your customers or to your users that is giving them value. And so, you know, Darren is right. If you are a cloud platform and you're offering that abstraction to your users and your users don't care, uh, then it's probably a useful trend for them. But if you happen to be uh, somebody, a big company or whatnot, who, where you are responsible for that platform, maybe you're... Uh, outsourcing the infrastructure level stuff, but not the platform as a service, the Kubernetes level stuff. And you also want to be able to take that to other cloud platforms and not be locked into one necessarily. Um, Then you do care about the OS still, right? You're still making that choice and you want to choose your platform Mm -hmm. based on that. So it depends. Yeah. Yeah, I want to follow because the, you, uh, it's like, it's kind of like, as we move into this cloud native world, it's all kind of reducing the burden on the, um, the operator or whatever, even if you're running yourself, you know, data center or whatever, you know, it's, you know, I think, um, you know, core OS, uh, in the early days and now Fedora core OS really kind of pioneered this, this kind of, uh, what is it? A self-driving car kind of, uh, mentality of, uh, of, you know, it just you treat it more like a, a phone or, or whatever it just updates and you know reboots or whatever and it, it, so it's all about reducing the ma- the maintenance which um which a lot of that also is about re- re- reducing the variability in the os um so like if if you say like the, the trend is going towards re- reducing the maintenance and the variability um that also means that like f- i think fragmentation doesn't get as bad you know it's like you it's know, a so tiny much. Thing. It's like it's a, the thing is that it's a tiny thing that runs underneath underneath the container. The line of the containers underneath that. What is there? Yeah, and, that, and I think one of the interesting things that's happened is the the LTS kernels. You know, from upstream, 
is kind of been, a, I think that's been a big deal that like there's actually LTS kernels upstream. So that's allowing more distributions and, and, and things like that to just say kind of piggyback off of that. And that kind of keeps the whole industry in sync, which is really quite nice. Um, because it's, you know, if, if you're, if you're driving, you know, Debian is coming up off of that or whatever they're trying, everyone's trying to kind yeah. of align to those LTS schedules, then it also reduces kind of the fragmentation. Because that's, that's a good mean, point. At the end of the day, the, the, the biggest thing you care about from the Linux, you know, from the container side is effectively the, you know, the Linux API and ABI, you know, as long as that, uh, yeah. That, that, I, I do want to, Tasha, you were starting to uh, jump in, you, you and Dusty had kind of a race condition there. Um, is, do, no, it, do you yeah. see it as a useful trend or, I mean, like it is, we've almost touched on another thing of like, do, do Kate's, you, Kubernetes users even care what's running underneath? Um, have, I mean, yeah, in an, in an ideal world, they wouldn't have to, but like, as we were saying earlier, when you start getting into what software, what your software is certified to run on from a container and host perspective, like you, uh, from an ISV perspective, you really need to like minimize the possible number of combinatorial, you know, comb like the matrix, like, 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 let's make this achievable, like to actually say we support our software. Um, so yeah, I would say that uh, it becomes just a supportability problem for the ISVs versus as an application developer, do I want to care? I really don't, right? Like I kind of just want to care about the exact changes I'm making my, to my application and have it be as atomic as possible. But then I always end up relying on something uh, that's at a lower level that ends up making things complicated. Um, from the cloud vendors perspectives, I think releasing their own Linux uh, distributions makes a lot of sense just from cost reduction um, and optimizing for their exact use case. They have a more limited number of hardware that they need to support, so they don't need like something that can really run on the huge swath of things you find in on-prem data centers. Um, they don't want to necessarily pay a vendor every time they spin up Linux. You know, they want to keep all of the money from the customer instead of just a smaller amount. So, yeah, I, I get it. Um, I don't know that it really translates to on-prem use cases where people are really consolidating their entire security posture around a limited number of Linux um, and Windows operating systems. They need to, you know, whether we agree with it or not, they want to run their uh, virus scanner against every single node, you know, so you, you just start running into like the exact uh, use cases and like that security checklist. So, yeah. Yeah, gosh, that security checklist. So that's, that's probably per pretty perfect segue. Um, are there different kinds of security considerations that you'd have like for Linux in general, when you're specifically running Kubernetes. So like in this, like we, we, you know, we said cloud native by and large, that's meaning like schedulable workloads that can be put on a cluster somewhere like Kubernetes. Um, so what kind of, you know, what kind of security or different security considerations are there for Linux when scheduling it on a, a Kubernetes node, Kubernetes node? So I to jump into that one. I wanted to just highlight something that is important to, to note as well, like from an OS vendor perspective, like there are two, like there's the operating system beneath the line that runs underneath the containers, but then like the containers are not built out of thin air. Like there are pieces in those containers that come from the, like usually that, that a large part of that container will come from the operating system. Like, yeah. and, and I think that's something which um, from a security perspective is the very, complicated unresolved problem in the transition to Kubernetes because- Yeah, even if you statically link, you, you still know, had to have a build route somewhere. Well, well, the thing is that statically linking already like makes everybody else look at you and saying, okay, uh, statically link, like- We stopped doing happened? that in the nineties, yeah. Well, yeah. What happened to the components <laughs> that went into that statically linked thing? Like, yeah. like, okay, like where do they come from? And so now you've got this huge um, provenance and attestation problem that the distribution is very neatly solved for you because we GPG sign every single binary that comes out there. And so, you know, this binary was built by a robot inside a system that in fact, I, I, I was part of building at Canonical. You know that that robot built that binary. Um, you can go to Canonical and say that binary there has a, it was compromised. And so you have that f perfect chain inside a single um, distributor. I'm not saying- Now, now throw that away so and just- Now yeah. you're saying, <laughs> guys, do whatever you want, you know, go to GitHub, find this thing, like get clone, get clone away, or even worse, like NPM, install your way into this mess. And now like, like that is the actual security problem that distributions ironically are very well um, set up to solve. Because again, the DNA of the distribution is to serve as a bridge between the madness, which is upstream and the predictability, which end users expect, right? 
and I use NPM as the example because it's, it's like the, the, the LSD um, oh, yeah. edition of that madness, right? So there was, a, there was a great tweet here recently of like, you know, this, that, wait, error, it's okay, ignore it, and wait, you know, introduce this many new packages, this many vulnerabilities, please donate to the, you know, beer. Yeah, it's like the, the first 10 people. minutes of anybody using NPM is like, if you're like, for, for like an old school person, it's like, what the hell did I just do? You know, like this thing <laughs> imported this dependency, which is like 10 lines, what the hell is that? So anyway, but the point is that that madness has to be resolved some way, right? They're going to, like somebody is going to have to give, to give these people that are developing on this side a set of components that they can use safely. You're saying statically linking, that's cool, but somebody has to be able to press a button in CICD and say, hey, bring in the new versions of these things. Oh, but they can't be API breaking, otherwise the app breaks. You know, like this, this sort of things which distributions are very known for, like we don't break the, the applications. If I break your app, I apologize, file a bug, I'll revert back that, that, that breaking change in the API because I keep stability for however long I promise to maintain distribution. Like that has to be- Yeah, there's kind of an academic challenge this new there. world. Like otherwise, like we're, we're, otherwise it's like it is proper dystopia, right? Otherwise, yeah. like you can't use anything. Yeah. I can't use my phone. I can't use a computer because everything <laughs> is hacked across the stack. <laughs> So, so to, to continue to, to derail it, because I want to bring up a couple points you, you touched and we, on. And we only have like five minutes, so get it. <laughs> oh, shoot. Well, no, but I think this is really, really, uh, well, whatever. It's interesting because I'm saying it. But um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're biased. I see. Yes. See the, um, but no, if you look, because I, you know, before I was saying this, like, I, I think the role of the Linux distribution is completely changing because all of those assets, like, let's say, like your RPMs, your Debian packages, or whatever, like, those are all valuable and they're well curated. That's an extremely difficult thing. But what's different? What's happening now is like the kind of traditional, the way that things were before is you would install this generic thing and then you would kind of mutate it there into what it was going to be. Um, and you know, that's the way Puppet, Chef, Configuration Management, Salt, all those things work, you know, Ansible, is it's kind of, you form it, you know, it's like this clay that you form into what it's supposed to be once it gets there. And we're shifting all of that earlier into the pipeline. And so it's now basically, I want to take all of those assets, those RPMs or, or Debian packages, and I want to do one of two things. I want to build an OS image, which then turns into an immutable container optimized Linux, or I want to build a Docker packet or Docker, Docker image. Um, which then becomes your container runtime. So it's like we're moving this kind of mutability and, and assembling of all this stuff earlier in the stage to produce these like reusable assets that we can more easily track. And you look at the big advantages of containers in general, a lot of it has to do with distribution management pipeline. That's where you get a lot of the value out of them. And so it's like by shifting everything kind of earlier and more predictable, um, you know, it completely change, changes the game. So it's like those assets are still useful. I don't think they're going to go anywhere, but it's just presented all differently. But people have this, to this, RPM. This, this like sounds like the, the like this sounds like the benefit of when people would would uh, solve things at compile time versus runtime. Like yeah, yeah, something exactly. Out, waiting for it to it, some Python and, or Ruby library to explode on the edge. And the lead into security is that like I don't think necessarily the security requirements of containers change, but security and the models that we have are changing such that we can make it more secure because you know we're building like we're we're creating immutable assets that we're deploying so we can cryptographically ensure that the right thing is is put there so it's like what i'm seeing with containers and and stuff and all this kind of immutability is that we can greatly increase the level of security because we can you know like secure boot fully verify things dm verity verify the os if it's immutable the whole stack we can basically can verify everything that's going on because you know we're changing the way that we're packaging and delivering linux as an os and, and the software yeah. that's running on it i like that a lot tasha dusty hey, tasha what you have anything to say on that um you know I, it just kind of occurs to me that like the one thing we're really not talking about is uh how some of these uh cloud focused uh forays into Linux really are under investing in the wide community of people who spend a lot of time maintaining all of the various packages and capabilities that they're all leveraging. Um, and, you know, I just start thinking about like, is Amazon donating to like open SSL, right? Like, I mean, it just kind of feels like there is like a certain um, 
lack of understanding of how many hardworking people there are like throughout the world who are constantly updating Linux and like keeping really important packages up to date that we then all consume and leverage. Um, and actually like kind of one of my pitches sometimes is like when people are worried about security in enterprises, I'm like, you should understand every package you're deploying and make sure that you're not relying on something that has one guy in Berkeley, like desperately trying to keep up to date, yeah. like on his free time. Or even which, worse, which, unfortunately, five years ago, which is, yeah. which is what, which, what typically happens, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Not only the, the recent XKCD about, you know, one, one person out in Nebraska that broke the internet or whatever, but no, and, 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 and it is crazy because often when people hear that of like, oh, you should, you should actually be familiar with the lines of code that you're importing, whether it's Golang or NPM, like, and it, it's usually, it's like the gut reaction is that it's, that's such an overwhelming reaction or, you know, ask that people just laugh it off as a joke. And it's like, oh, that is the joke. <laughs> like you, you didn't own it. Therefore, good luck. Have fun. Dusty, do you have any comments on that one? Uh, <laughs> uh, not, not specifically to what Tasha just mentioned. I mean, obviously, yeah. I mean, there are well, so you work, many. You worked in the Fedora community as well, so that's not a small community either. No, not not at all. And there's so many people that need many more things uh, for every everything they do every day uh, in the Fedora community, in the Debian community, in the Ubuntu community, in the Gentoo community. Everybody. It really is, um, you know, many different people all over the world, many different companies all over the world coming together. And, uh, you know, I think I think some of the cloud providers are getting to a point where they they realize that if they they can't just survive forever without um, heavily investing in this part that they they started to build up. So, yeah, I, th I think it, it's starting to get a little better, but I'm just one person. I mean in the in the cloud providers um you know kind of you know it's like open source kind of started with this ideal you know it's kind of like the random person contributing and in their free time doing things and there's still a lot of that of course but it's been tricky over the years has as open source has also become the business model of so many companies is is people they're paying people to work on open source so now you have a lot of people who get paid to work on open source versus the people who kind of do it in their free time. And so it's very difficult to balance that because a lot of people are making a decent living working on open source. And there's some people who are kind of, you know, um, giving up their time for free and they really, you know, kind of really shouldn't, or maybe they, they don't want to. And it's, and it's difficult, but I, I think the cloud vendors have definitely like recognized this. And if, you know, you look at all, all three, like the big three of Amazon, Microsoft, and Google, I mean, all of them over the last couple of years have had major pushes in the open source space. Um, you know, yeah, it's easy to say open source is in a lot of ways, yeah. Yeah, so it's like, you know, I I, I think things are changing, uh, changing for the better. But there's always there's always more. I mean, I see, I'm I always I feel so bad for uh, open source maintainers uh, burning out. You know, you just see it so often. Yeah, um, That's, it's a, it is one of those big things that I have to remind people often of like, even if you work for somebody, you know, it, it's still your name on the line when you put, put up a PR or LGTM something. Like, yeah. Don't forget that it's still you as a human. Yeah, yeah. So it's a tricky one. I mean, I don't have any answers or anything. But yeah. It's something for well, me good. to be mindful of. Well, in, in wrapping up, I mean, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. I think we've covered how the the operating system whether it's general purpose or container optimized is still kind of the glue between different people's expectations you know uh, kind of working with the upstream um, having their own cadences working with the different companies involved and then for by and large you know we, we're reusing a lot of these uh, the work done and the kind of like infrastructure and methodology uh, whether it is for kind of an operations or an application person's uh, piece of it where you whether you own the whole stack yourself or you're wanting to pay somebody for it um, and in either one of those cases most people are wanting to push for something that's more supportable something that's more predictable um, so I think that's probably why anybody could argue the case for both general purpose or something container optimized is because they want it to be supportable for their use case so um, Tasha Darren Christian and Dusty I appreciate you all for your, for your time and um, if there's nothing else, then we can probably open it up for a few questions.